think writers, novelists especially, are very much to blame for promoting their work to some mythological status. A sort of mystique it's rubbish. of being a writer. Yes, it is rubbish. It's a job like anything else. But you sit down, and the secret is you stay sitting. Uh, that was the voice of Bernice Rubens, who was born 100 years ago this year, and it was going to be the subject of the latest Booker Prize podcast with me, James Walton. And me, Joe Hamier. But before we get on to Bernice, we're going to look at her life generally, but also concentrate on the book that she won the Booker Prize with, which was the elected member in 1970, second ever Booker Prize, the first woman to win, and still the only Welsh person to win. Um, and her book is a, a pretty close-up view of family life. So, uh, Joe, where do, you, where do you fit into your siblings and things? Um, I I have one younger sister, and then I'm... Well, my mum's Polish, my dad's Ugandan, so there's a sort of weird sense that my cousins are also my brothers and sisters. And in fact, in Polish, you don't really say cousin, you say um, the brother who belongs to your aunt, or, you know, the sister who belongs uh, okay. to, your, to your uncle. Um, uh, but I'm the eldest, and... I think probably classic eldest daughter syndrome. You know, I I rewrote all of their personal statements when they were <laughs> trying to get into uni. I would um, babysit them at family parties. Um, I think it it does make for a really neurotic <laughs> personality. So I see where um, Norman in the elected mem- member is um, coming from. It's a lot of pressure, a lot of stress to take. Uh, fair enough. Uh, well, um, um, I'm also the oldest, actually, of, and I've got two younger sisters, and I don't know really. I, I, I like to think I was the golden boy, but I'm not sure that's entirely true. <laughs> I do, I do know that now that my mum's getting a bit older, um, she's on Merseyside where my two sisters live, so they do far more of the looking after. But if I sort of pop home for a, a weekend or something, that's I'm just the greatest person in the world, <laughs> and they're sort of they're sort of flogging their guts out, looking after a loads of the time, and then I just make make the odd phone call, show up, and you know, oh James, how we are, uh, which I, which I must say they take in very good, very good heart. It would drive me nuts if I was them. But it it is sort of true that the oldest sort of becomes the golden child in a weird way. They're like the benchmark. They set the standard, especially if you're like a high achiever, which I think is probably. Fair to say we both try to be. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, okay, achiever of, of, yeah, achiever of, of, of some level to be to be debated. But should we, should we uh, turn to our subject this week of Bernice Rubens? This is, um, as I say, born a hundred uh, years ago, first woman to win, second winner, um, and oh, with, uh, we probably should say for our American listeners that the elected member is called Chosen People. Was called Chosen People in America. Really? Yeah, for reasons that we can uh, discuss. Oh, I uh, totally I think. knew that. Yeah. Oh, can I just do? But the nineteen seventy. Um, and I just do a few tales, tales from Granddad, because I was, yes, I, I was, in, yes, <laughs> I was in fact alive. <laughs> How old were you in 1970, Jesus? <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, uh, quite quite young. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, no, so I was, Making it sound like you were, you know, walking around as a 20 year old man. No, no, no. I, I was quite young, but 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 remember some of it. I remember, I remember the, the first general election. I remember mm-hmm. which uh, the Conservatives won under. Uh, Edward Teeth. Uh, I remember it was still pre-decimal currency, pound shillings and pence. I remember, I remember Apollo 13. The, the thing I actually do remember really, really vividly was the World Cup uh, in Mexico. Uh, I think for people of a certain generation, Brazil 1970 was as good as football ever got. Mm. Uh, what I found out since that I don't remember at all, uh, not surprisingly, it was, it was the first Glastonbury. Uh, I, don't, I didn't remember that, but um, it's also when the Beatles split up. Uh, one thing that's not changed, actually, though, on, uh, in August, of fact, yeah, Rolling Stones uh, started a European tour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so 1970, but also um, the 1970 Booker Prize. Um, so this is only its second year, but it seemed to be pretty, seemed to have, that seemed to have hit the ground pretty much running. Also had quite a distinguished shortlist. Iris Murdoch uh, with Bruno's Dream, William Trevor, Mrs. Eckdorf at O'Neill's Hotel. And I think it's quite interesting. Um, Elizabeth Bowen. Um, Famous for, uh, I think, a great Blitz novel, The Heat of the Day, was shortlisted for Eva Trout. But that, as far as, it, as I can work it out, means that she's the only ever shortlisted book author who was born in the 19th century. Really? hmm And, uh, as was one of the judges, uh, Rebecca West, who had a oh. child with H.G. Wells in 1914 <laughs> and, and was, was a booker judge. But um, I'd, I'd just like to say that even in those days there was shock omissions. I don't know if newspapers yeah. use the word snub, <laughs> but the book that was snubbed stroke shock, shockingly omitted that year was um, The French Lieutenant's Woman by uh, John Fowles, 
And I spoke to the chair of the judges that year, David Holloway, a few years later, and he and he said he did he did regret that they sh- hadn't shortlisted that. He thought it was a mistake. Um, and the headline when Bernice Rubens won for the elected member in the Liverpool Daily Post was "Unknown Novel Wins Top Award." Um, but even then, you know, the Booker the Booker effect was there because the chosen people, as it was to say, it was in America, uh, sold uh, fourteen thousand uh, copies in the next week in America. So um, so already um, it's uh, it's hit the ground running. I read Bernice um, Rubin's autobiography, When I Grow Up. Um, Isn't it the last thing she ever wrote? Yes, and it was actually so last that it was published posthumously. Yeah. Um, and she doesn't mention the elected member at all. In fact, one of her, the only couple of passing mentions of the booker is one that when she's buying a flat in the early 70s, she says, uh, you know, I, bought, I decided to buy a flat. I borrowed a book from my mum. I'd recently won the booker and that helped too. And that's, <laughs> and that's it. It doesn't name the book. But she does talk about the statuette. And her daughters had added pubic hair to the crotch and armpits, if I may say. Oh, and the other thing she does talk about is she judged the Booker Prize in 1986. And one of my favourite Booker facts used to be that, um, as far, again, as far as I can see, there's only been one once where four of the five judges have been women. Mm. And that was 1986. And the winner was not only a bloke, but it was Kingsley Amis. Oh, Jesus. Not normally thought of as the most feminist. Um, although, uh, disappointingly... Uh, Maybe he had good chat. Bernice Rubens, I don't think, was very pleased about that. She says, uh, in When I Grow Up, her autobiography, prize went to Kingsley Amos's The Old Devils, certainly a book that made you laugh. You read it straight on a Monday and forgot it on the Tuesday. <laughs> um, so she, it was a depressing decision, she says. Uh, but you, you've got possibly even more interesting things about the 1970 Booker Prize than that, have you? I mean, I've got the judges' notes from that year. So if, if, as context to our listeners, before I uh, became the host of this podcast, I was working for Booker as uh, an archivist of sorts. Booker has a wonderful uh, archive at Oxford Brooks uh, University Library, and it's filled with press clippings and ceremony footage and administrative I would love that so much. letters. But it's also filled with judges' notes. And I really wanted to see them because I think... I think I kind of knew on instinct that Dame Rebecca West was always going to instigate some sort of cattiness. Yeah. <laughs> There's a rather fabulous letter from from David Holloway, who had recently been to a judge's lunch and Rebecca West had just returned from Mexico City. She's sort of famously always flying off to America or mm. South America and missing judges meetings. I, I mean, I think that kind of grand dame has more or less disappeared now, isn't it? But she must have been well, a, a bit of me thereof. Yeah, well, Holloway says... Uh, she walks like a dame, she talks like a dame, and I wish that she had stayed in Mexico City. <laughs> I fear that we're going to have a rather long, hard day on the 22nd. I take it that the others, like me, will agree that the extra books Dame Rebecca has added to the list will have to be considered. And there's this sort of whole thing. He's writing to Marilyn Edwards, who is then secretary, this sort of laboured thing of, oh, we've got to deal with her. Um, but I have to say that her notes... Uh, on which books should be considered for the shortlist. There was no long list back then, are amazing. So her notes uh, are incredible and they range from uh, on Bridget Brophy's In Transit, Twaddle, out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on The Fire Dew Dwellers by Margaret Lawrence, cheaply written and nothing underneath it except a familiar story to which nothing has been added, out. Uh, even when she's being complimentary and putting a book in, as with Richard Powers' The Hungry Grass, she says, I have a most odd feeling about this book. I read it with a pleasure and a sustained interest in the leading character, but the story is so badly told that I really cannot understand the significance the reader is supposed to attach to most of the episodes. I should have said a quite incompetent book, yet there is solidity in Conroy's character and I got a definite pleasure from reading it. Mixed reviews. Uh, indeed. And that, did that make the shortlist? I can't remember. Uh, no, it didn't. Of of the famous omission from that year, John Fowles is the French lieutenant's woman. Dame Rebecca says, this seems a foolish enterprise and worked out with very little talent. The last paragraph seems to me remarkable in its pretentiousness. Oh, wow. So and, I wonder if she just basically got her way. I wonder if that was why it wasn't in. I mean, you can only guess. Well, she has uh, an extremely sort of interesting review of our winner. The elected member by Bernice Rubens. Okay. One sentence that says, I wish Jewish authors would not write of themselves as if they were strange animals in the zoo, but this is a good and touching and funny book. 
<laughs> oh, thanks, Joe. Um, should we do a bit about a bit on Rubens herself then? Yes, we should. I feel like having read her autobiography, you you are more au fait with Rubens history than I. Okay, in that case, I will clear my throat and begin a very interesting beginning, actually, which is why she grew up in Cardiff. Yes, uh, which was her father was a Lithuanian uh, Jew who came to Hamburg, which was. Uh, so this would be around the turn of the century, I think, uh, 20th century, uh, obviously. And uh, that was the centre of getting Jews to America uh, from Tsarist Russia, as it still was then. Except there was a lot of con men there. So they would say, yes, that they would charge people for tickets to New York and send them to uh, Liverpool, Cardiff or, or whatever. <laughs> sure enough, that's what happened to her father. He was sent, he was sent to Cardiff. And according to her, it, took him th- it, it was three weeks because he didn't speak English. He <laughs> spoke, spoke Yiddish. And uh, three weeks before he realised that Cardiff wasn't New York. <laughs> There must have been a few. A few, a few. She also says, oh, which is very interesting, I, I, I don't know enough about history or sociology to know, but the, the sort of enormous growth in um, Jewish people in Britain at the, in the early 20th century was simply because of this con thing going on in, in Hamburg. And uh, she did consider herself very Jewish. Uh, when, on Desert Island Discs, she was asked, how important is your Jewishness to you? I think it was Sue Lawley in those days. And she says, it is me. Uh, she says, not all their books are Jewish, although... As we'll find out, the elected member certainly is, but they all do have a Jewish vision. And when her dad arrived in, in Cardiff, he was a tallyman, so he would buy clothes, I think, in the city and then go and sell them around in the in the valleys, uh, in the mining valleys of South Wales. And <laughs> she, she would sometimes go with him and would hear the miners coming out of the pits singing in close harmony. Um, and also, it was an amazing family. So in this little small house in Splot in Cardiff, there was her and her three siblings, all of whom became very accomplished professional musicians. Yes. So there's her brother, Harold, who was the infant prodigy and I would suggest the basis for the, for the, the main character in um, The Elected Member. He became um, a concert pianist of, of great note uh, before certain mental issues set in. Uh, her sister Beryl uh, played uh, in the orchestra for the Welsh Opera and her brother Cyril was a violinist for the London Symphony Orchestra. And uh, you know, what, a, what a thing to come out of a small house in a spot. Anyway, uh, she also uh, wished she'd been a musician too. She's always... Uh, again, on Desert Island Discs, she says she considers herself a successful novelist who failed to become a musician. Oh, that's, that was my line. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just mean that I frequently say this oh, uh, as well. But she ended up learning how to play cello and piano, didn't she? she did. Quite well. Yeah. I mean, quite well by all of our standards, I think. Yeah. Not very well by her family standards. And she also said she would give up all of her novels to play one bar like Rostropovich, who I believe was a cellist. Her, her story is that her family couldn't afford a cello. So. Yeah. By the time they could, it was too late for her to reach the level that, that uh, the rest of her family did. So she went off to Cardiff University, became a teacher. She was sacked in from a Birmingham school for campaigning against caning. Um, Good woman. She, exactly. She published her first novel in 1960. Well, she married Rudy Nassau, who was also um, a, a, a writer, who she seems to have I- I- adored. Uh, mm. But he was extremely unfaithful and left her for a, a woman she describes in her autobiography as, quote, Ugly, thick, and sublimely boring. <laughs> <laughs> so no hard feelings there. Well, uh, I mean, she'd had 23 years of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, he'd already had a child, which she didn't know, and that was a shattering to her. But then uh, even uh, when he was dying, I think, more or less, in his last illness, she, she looked after him. She looked after Rudy. A prolific author, 26 novels in all, um, as well as autobiography. Um, shortlisted again for the booker with a, a five-year sentence, when, um, which was the favourite of her novels. Uh, but Iris Murdoch, who was on that 1970 shortlist, uh, got her revenge that year by winning with The Sea, The Sea, 1978. And her main subject, she says herself, is was family. Everything that happens in family is more so in a Jewish family, she says. Um, is also quite famous for her friendship with Beryl Bainbridge, who was shortlisted for the Booker Prize many times without winning. And I, I, I remember the two of them when I first got into the literary world, just at the side of the, the room, smoking a lot of cigarettes. A witch room? Uh, at, 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 at sort of literary parties. It would be the two of them just sort of looking on <laughs> with their fags. And uh, actually, it's a rather nice bit where uh, um, Beryl Bainbridge provides a forward to, to the autobiography when I grew up. And she says this. She said, uh, so me, m- me and Bernice, as adults, we had loved the men we married and they had walked away crashing our hopes, after which we had gone in for gentlemen callers. Which <laughs> <laughs> is a great phrase. Uh, the one thing that we were equal to was our devotion to cigarettes. We smoked as if there was no tomorrow, which of course there isn't. <laughs> and then um, they have an argument about whether what they're looking for in men. Beryl writes, um, neither of us had ever fallen for anyone for reasons higher up than the waist. <laughs> 
so that, 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 there was that friendship, which was uh, which was fantastic. Um, and they were also both fans of soap operas. So that's my there, there they are. There's Bernice Rubens in in the smallest She's of fabulous. nutshells. Uh, so, I mean, she is she is terrific. Do you want to say a bit? Uh, so we probably should move on to the book then. Yes, we should. Do you want to say a bit about that? The elected member uh, takes place in the east end of London, and it concerns the Zvek family, who bears a. Uh, a, a passing resemblance <laughs> to Rubens' own upbringing. Uh, their patriarch is the rabbi Svek, who also emigrated to London, uh, married and then had three children, uh, the eldest, Norman, uh, and then the middle child, Bella, and the youngest, Esther. He has this sort of slightly <laughs> hysterical and demanding wife uh, who, who determines at a very early stage that Norman is a prodigy. That's because he picks up languages like no other. I think by the time he's sort of seven or something, he speaks fluent Polish and Yiddish and English, and then he picks up the romantic languages and then he picks up sort of Russian. And so she begins to uh, stagger his age because this is of interest to the local papers and she makes him younger and younger so that by the time he reaches his bar mitzvah which I think is supposed to be at the age of um, 13 he's actually 16 that's right she's still saying he's 13 yeah this also has an effect on Bella this is a, a theme of the novel that a lot of uh, the hardships that Norman goes through uh, tend to compound themselves on Bella whose uh, age is also staggered there's a really touching part of the novel where um, Bella, uh, who throughout the whole book wears white cotton socks, the ones she had from girlhood, as a 14-year-old or 15-year-old uh, takes a pair of her mum's silk stockings and tries to put them on and her mum absolutely forbids it because she's supposed to be 11 or 12 <laughs> in accordance with um, Norman's staggered ageing. Anyway, and then uh, she ends up wearing ankle socks for the rest of her life. Then. Yes, so uh, Norman sort of fulfills uh, his prophecy of, of being a prodigy. He becomes a fairly successful lawyer who the Jewish community in London really revere. Until he's not. He gets addicted to amphetamines. And uh, he, it sort of, in the way of all addictions, it starts as him taking, you know, a pill a day and then that's not enough to sort of trigger a reaction. Then he takes two and then he takes four and then a handful until he begins hallucinating and it turns him into a completely different person. Crucially one who sees silverfish crawling all around his room. There were two insects, aren't they? I had to look that up. Yeah. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the, yeah, the sort of creepy crawlies. And that's actually the book begins with him. Sort of. Yes. Necking amphetamines and seeing <laughs> That's where we meet him. This is massively distressing to Rabbi Zvek, who uh, by this point has lost his wife and is also estranged from his daughter Esther because she's decided to marry outside of the Jewish faith to a Sorry. perfectly nice chap called John. Rabbi Zvek's got that thing because he's basically promised his he promised his dying wife that he would never reconcile with Esther. Yes. And and so he's sort of <laughs> stuck with that. Anyway, yeah. It's really heartbreaking. Norman, in the end, is committed to a psychiatric hospital, which really puts a strain on the family. I mean, Rabbi Zvex is sort of torn between the intense concern he feels for his son, but also for himself and yeah. how it, I mean, genuinely is impacting his physical health. He has a heart attack midway through the book out of stress. And the only person left to pick all of this up is the middle child, Bella, who I think grows in resentment as the novel progresses, she's her life has essentially been stunted because of Norman from the moment that she had to pretend to be 11 when she was 14. That really is, <laughs> I, I suppose, all I can say about the novel without spoiling it. It sort of revolves around this tension that's woven into every aspect of the Zvek fa family dynamic. But, but it's incredibly sad because they all love each other. This oh, massively. Is not, this is not a product of sort of well, I was going to say abuse, but actually, there's a passage in in her autobiography that I, I keep mentioning when I when I grow up, um, where uh, which I think is is, is central to understanding um, the elected member really. Uh, and she says here, "I cannot even claim an abused childhood. My father never suffered unemployment. My mother took in nobody's washing. No uncle laid a finger on me, and I was never hungry. Yet I was abused. We all were, my brothers and sister, by parental expectation." Such expectation is abuse of a kind. It doesn't matter that it was motivated by love. 
its effect was damaging and long lasting. And I, I, I think it's harsh, I must say, but that's clearly what she thinks. So parental expectation as abuse is at the heart of this book, isn't it? And also that idea that of parents never being able to let their children go. Yes, but uh, that it, it, as, you, as you say, it, it doesn't sort of preclude the idea of love. So even as doctors are carting Norman off to a mental hospital, Rabbi Zvek experiences this as real sort of um, paternal pain. There's a passage that I, actually made me cry. It goes, Papa, Norman called from his room. His voice was desperate and imploring like a little boy's. It was a cry for immediate help and protection. It was a cry of physical pain. And Rabbi Zvek responded. Whatever had happened to his son, he would kiss it better and tell him a story to keep his mind off the pain. He hurried to Norman's room. I mean... No, no, it's, it, no it, is, and it, 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 is, it is a really heartbreaking book. And part of the heartbreakingness is that nothing... That it's almost, as I say, it's not... It's, I, I, I have already said that, but they loved each other. But in fact, it is the fact that they love each other that causes all the damage, really. Yes. But it, 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 and that, that's even worse. Um, and, and again, a big theme of the book and her autobiography, and I think uh, other of her books, is the, the idea of parents being unable to let go. Um, I mean, she says about her own parents, I knew they were vo- motivated by love, but they saw us not as individuals, but extensions of themselves. They could not bring themselves to let us go. And then speaks of her own parenting. Later on with my own children, I learned that letting go is the hardest goal for a parent to achieve. Try as I would, I could never relinquish that hold. Uh, and of her own first child, Sharon was my first child, and as such, she bore the brunt of my expectations. Why well, I was not mom's daughter for nothing. <laughs> so uh, the, the impossibility of doing anything about it. And, and, and one of the patients in the mental hospital where Norman's holed up, who actually, unfortunately for Norman, is a great source of amphetamines. <laughs> the uh, minister. The minister of health, he calls I himself. I love this guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, partly Norman wants to get out of the mental hospital because, you know, um, it's horrible. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, he can get some bang on, you know, get some pretty good drugs there from and the minister. And cheaper than, yeah, than cheaper on the than outside. he's ever had. Uh, it's this one, uh, again, a very sad scene where he rings Bella and says, you know, can you bring what he needs? Because he's being charged a pound a week for as many drugs as he wants. Yes. But he hasn't got any money because he's in a mental hospital. So he rings Bella and says, can you bring me some money, please? Because I'd like to buy some chocolate. So Bella thinks, actually, I'll tell you what would be even nicer, to go and buy him the best chocolate money he can buy. So he turns up with actual chocolate and he's like, where's the bloody money? Uh, and then yeah. she sort of lets him, she realises what's gone on there and, and lets him steal from her purse. Yes. I think, you know, we've been talking about the novel as a as a kind of family oriented one, but it's also a, an astonishingly good depiction of what addiction does to a family. I found that scene of, it's quite prolonged, the scene of Bella realising that Norman is sort of distracting, trying to distract her and Rabbi Zvek while he kind of uses his foot to slide her bag over to his bed so that yeah. she can he can steal the money from it. It's actually money from the family shop. So he's really stealing from them all. I found the description of her being aware and facilitating it. Not that she ignores it. She actually distracts Rabbi Zvek so that Norman can get on with the job properly and then tries to think of an excuse as to why the money has gone missing so that she can exculpate him. That sort of conflict of, I want him to get better, but I don't want him to be in pain. The, one of the things the minister says to to uh, the rabbi when he shows up, is you realise that one the one thing that all these people in this uh, family have got in common is um, that we've all got families. Yeah. And um, minister is, has got this big idea that, as far as he's as far as the minister's concerned, everything bad that happens to him, his mother regards as something terrible happening to her. It's basically just all about her. If you want to be brutal, that's slightly true of the other members of Norman's family as well. They do feel sorry for him, but they also feel awfully sorry for themselves. All that, all that infant prodigy stuff, Norman and his life, had been an event for them all. It was something that happened to them and had ultimately nothing to do with Norman at all. This, this, this is the narrator speaking. And now Norman was in a nuthouse asserting his rights, the right not to have been chosen. I, I, I think this book is full of sort of equal opportunity offenders. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's not as though they don't bring some of their own misery on themselves. I mean... As far as the relationship between the siblings, Norman, Bella and Esther, there's a sort of, um, the novel builds to an explanation as to why Norman got addicted to amphetamines in the first place. And yes, it's tangentially to do with the fact that he was the elected family prodigy, 
particularly by his mother, but also slightly to do with the fact that he can't handle the fact that he's gay and that actually... Well, just, I'd, I'd, I'd like to come on to this, or maybe even leave it. I've got one theory, which is that um, Bernard, Bernice Rubens talks quite proudly about only ever, ever doing one draft of a novel. And yeah. she just has no idea what the plot is. She just writes it and it all falls into place and that's the draft and she sends it off. I do wonder if the bits of this book that are left a bit hanging... In Do what they, sense? Well, for for example, the fact that he's sort of, so centrally, he is he is driven mad by the expectations of his family, particularly his mother, but then which his father sort of inherits. Um, and but then there's there's at least two other, and that all seems to hang together pretty well. But there's at least two other things. There is that thing that I think you alluded to that you know that he and Bella have incest i mean i don't think there's any much doubt about it she recalled the story because she needed to because she needed to acknowledge her part in her brother's disintegration and then we flash back to his bar mitzvah uh, which ends with uh norman went over to the window and as he did so bella slipped inside the sheets now the room was quite dark and she felt her brother moving beside the bed and soon his forbidden body alongside her so i think that's i think that's pretty unambiguous but then there's also a, a rather complicated story whereby the reason Esther, the one who married out, married out was because he sort of tricked her that the Jewish guy she wanted to marry was gay mm -hmm. because he, um, Norman, fancied the, the guy and that guy kills himself. Um, well, I, th I think we should clarify. So Norman has a best friend whose name is David. That's right. It? Yes. Norman has a best friend whose name is David. Yeah. David sort of starts to fancy uh, Norman's younger sister, Esther. Yeah. She quite likes him in return. And there's talk of them maybe at some point getting married. So they get engaged. Meanwhile, Esther has sort of had a wobble with this guy, John, who works at the nearby library. And Norman, who is in love with David, seizes upon this and tells Esther, you know, I've been trying to leave our family home for years now and mother keeps stopping me. You should do whatever you want with your life you know, just leave, write them a letter saying that you've married John and go, which Esther does. She's convinced by him. And uh, not long after, Norman finds um, David dead, it, heartbroken. He's committed suicide. And, and that ostensibly is why he starts taking amphetamines and also why Esther sort of um, ends up marrying John out of guilt. I think she was quite like John, but wanted to marry David because he was Jewish. Yes. And that life would be easier. And is persuaded by, this is all, this is all maybe a bit complicated to follow for, for <laughs> listeners, but uh, Norman says, no, you can't, you can't do that because David's gay. Yes. Clearly wanted him for himself. But do you think that, do you think that, as I say, back to my sort of first draft theory, yes, it, do you think that hangs together and builds to that? Or do you think it sort of, it sort of occurs to Billy Street when she throws it in and it's never quite, doesn't quite all quite doesn't all quite hang together, I don't think. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that it probably sort of occurred to her while writing. There, there is actually somewhere an interview, or I think I read this in her obituary in the Guardian, where she says that she plans her characters, but not the plot. Otherwise, the novel would be boring to write. But I, I don't have as much of an issue about it uh, as you seem to. Uh, on both counts, both the incest and the sort of family psychodrama around who's gay and who's marrying who, interfaith relationships and whatnot. With the incest, I, I was thrown by it at first, but I think it sort of slightly explains Bella's st stunted development a little more. The idea of why she would never marry and also her attachment to Norman, despite the amount of resentment that flows through this novel. I mean, she really at certain points sounds like she hates him, both for causing their father physical and mental distress and also for taking up so much of her time and life. Yeah. She has to look after him and then eventually she has to look after, she has to play host to their aunt Sadie who comes along to look after Norman and Rabbi Jvek when he falls ill. Um, and then insofar as the, the whole sort of plot with David, John, Esther and Norman, I believe in it as a sort of counterpoint to this idea that everything that's bad to you happens to you because of your parents, <laughs> which I think my mother, who again does listen to this podcast, will be, glad, will be glad to know I don't fully buy. Like, yes, you are influenced by your parents, but 
you make your own screw ups as life goes along. And I think Norman's screw up is egregious. And it does sort of make me believe more in the idea of him as a drug addict, because being a drug addict, just because your mum and dad thought you were a prodigy is, I don't know, I don't really buy that. But becoming a prodigy in the eyes of your parents and then becoming an extremely repressed person as a result of that and making numerous bad decisions as a result of that to the point where you're complicit in your best friend's suicide and your sister's estrangement i believe in much more as a as a route to addiction why i found reading this book so um fun to be honest is that it is a little bit like playing the therapist, you do have to think hard about why this family moves the way it does and what characters' motives are. It, it's a really humanising book to read, which is actually also what I think it was also David Holloway said to Booker McConnell in a letter justifying uh, the elected member as, as their winner. He says uh, of the elected member, here was a book that clamoured to be given the prize. It took hold of the judge's imaginations quite rapidly and would not be denied. Although the author has given it a very exact and much detailed background of life in the Jewish community in the East End of London, the problem that it uh, discusses so brilliantly uh, is the universality of the Zvek family, which has pinned its which has pinned all its faith on the future of Norman. And it goes on. But I think this idea that the the novel sort of sticks itself in your mind and almost evolves from there, it grows. You can't get rid of these characters' voices. You start to sort of reason on their behalf. Is part of that um, ability for Rubens to drop in the, the right details at the right moment moment no. and so you could in a sense at some point uh, at, at certain instances sorry um call them underdeveloped and i think that is a result of first draft syndrome but i don't think they're entirely sort of misguided attempts they do their job quite well um well okay i think we yeah i mean they, they're, they're strike <laughs> they're striking certainly and they certainly don't spoil the book i mean i mean almost partly because they're so underdeveloped really i, 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 I might be giving the impression that you know the book was ruined for me by these little bits and pieces that didn't quite work but it's partly because they are little bits and pieces really and the main thrust of the book is so fantastic and so many great individual scenes and individual moments like you're talking about when he found the minister dead in his bath i mean a, a guy he does love really but his first thought does was, he uh, well, well his first thought is i won't be able to get any drugs anymore <laughs> Uh, which which is a, an unbelievably brilliant addict's response, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then there's one fantastic scene where his his father is is obsessed all the way through about where he's getting these amphetamines from. Yeah. And he finds a bit of paper in um, his dressing in his dressing. Gown. Oh my god, I love that scene. I know, and he and he thinks this must be where he's going, so he goes to this address. And it's clear to us quite early on that this is a prostitute, but he's all the way through. He's sort of he's this slightly sort of shabby woman in a in a in a dressing gown and then says you know uh, yes I'm, I'm here to see the doctor <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's sort of funny and then he finds himself slightly fancying the woman yeah. much to his own disgust and that's a, that's a, just a brilliant that's a there's i think uh, what was most striking to me about that scene is you know she's wearing this bathrobe that she's for his benefit tied uh, quite tightly but her breast falls out of it and he can't help himself and it's not totally sexual though it slightly is he reaches a hand out and tucks her breast back into her bathrobe <laughs> yeah. and she just calls him a dirty old man but he's it's so like touchingly done that yeah. misunderstanding and and the end result of it because of that comment is that he goes home and he takes a really long bath and scrubs himself really hard yeah. it breaks my heart no he, he he is a really heartbreaking character but I, I i think i would still maintain that what's heartbreaking is also the fact that it confirms that theory of the ministers and i think of the book that parents still see it as something happening to them and and of course you would. And again, it's a completely blameless, but that's part of the problem. I should, we should, I should, before we go any further, because I've been meaning to do this for most of the thing, mm -hmm. um, most of the conversation so far is to, is to quote the epigraph, which is from R.D. Lang, yeah. which um, Bernice Rubin says sums up the book in a nutshell, which is, if patients are disturbed, their families are often very disturbing. <laughs> so true. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, uh, Joe, we, we normally uh, at this point ask who we recommend it to. Yeah. I, I'm certainly not going to recommend it to my children. That's for sure. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, 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 it, it, it is a good book, isn't it? I mean, I, I, oh yeah, it's amazing. Because uh, she's, she. I think it's probably fair to say that she's slightly faded. Has she from the sort of? 
you know, a great cultural imagination. Yeah, that's, well, yeah, whatever it is you fade from. Yeah, that's exactly yeah, the cultural <laughs> imagination. Yeah, Benice Rubens is one of the you know big post-war writers. I don't think it is would necessarily spring to people's minds anymore. Yeah, but that's this is a terrific book. Um, uh, I think that's a fair assessment. She sort of impressed herself as a as a woman and as a writer on me in a similar way to Muriel Spark, who we covered earlier yeah. in a previous episode, um, with loitering with intent. I mean, the those interviews of her saying that you know uh the the mistake of most writers is to mythologize their work as though it wasn't a job who could which could be done by anyone else or um this idea that you know she didn't have enough to do so she just started writing novels yeah we had right at the start it's fantastic energy i love her um i think i could listen to her talk all day and i could i'm probably going to go pick up more of her books after this i th- i i i think i think this might be a book that you would press into the hands of most sort of bookish friends of yours and say, look, because I think you, you mentioned Muriel Spark. I think Muriel Spark's maybe beginning, it, it has begun to fade a bit, but she's still got the prime of Miss Jean Brodie on mm-hmm. its side, which will be around forever. I think Benice Rubens is, is further on in the fading process. <laughs> and I would like to press this book into people's hands and say, look, you know, this, this woman should not be forgotten. Yeah, I agree with that. Also, I think it's universal in the sense that if you've got a parent, yeah, I mean that's what she says. <laughs> you'll, you'll just sob reading this book anyway. Well, that, 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 that's how I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, but that, that's how idea is that Jewish families are like other families only more so. Yeah. <laughs> so about anyway, that's, take that, Rebecca West, yeah, with your comment about yeah. the zoo. <laughs> Indeed. Um, well, that's it for this week. Uh, if you haven't already uh, follow the show, please do, and remember to leave a rating. You can find us at thebookerprizes.com and on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and Substack at The Book of Prizes. And next week, we're starting an occasional series where we look at books that are on school syllabuses, which we hope will um, save uh, students a bit of work and possibly even teachers too. And we're going to be starting that with Ian McEwan's Atonement. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. The Booker Prize podcast is hosted by Joe Hamia and me, James Walton. It's produced and edited by Kevin Miolo. And the executive producer is John Davenport. It's a Daddy Supiot production for the Booker Prizes.